All right, you may be seated. And as you're being seated, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles with me to Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 2. We're going to get right into the Word pretty quickly here this morning. That's the best place for us to be. And so we're going to get into the Word, Luke chapter 2. I hope you are having a very Merry Christmas so far. Uh, It is truly a blessing. It's a privilege for us to be able to worship together Sunday after Sunday, but it's especially a privilege for us to be able to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on a Sunday morning together with our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And so uh, it's so good to have families in here and children in here who normally may be in other areas uh, of our ministry on a typical Sunday morning, but we're having, it's family time in here. And as I look out and see all these families and you've got kids and grandparents and aunts and uncles, it's such a great, great time for us to worship the Lord together this morning. And, and we're going to do that as a family uh, throughout this time in the Word. And then at the end, We'll also have some family time uh, as the Holy Spirit leads us to, to uh, continue just drawing us together uh, as families and as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. We are uh, in the middle of our, uh, or towards the end actually of our sermon series, Messages from the Manger. And uh, we know that God sovereignly selected uh, different people to play a part in the story of the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we've been looking at some of the perspectives from these that God divinely designed and placed in the story of the birth of his son, our Savior Jesus. We've heard from Joseph, we've heard from Zechariah, and we've heard from Mary. We know Joseph's message uh, is obedience to God is always best. And we focused in on Matthew's gospel for that message. We heard from Zechariah. Zechariah's message to us was God answers prayer. And we heard from Mary last night. Mary's message to us is nothing is impossible with God. These messages that we have been examining, that we've been studying, that we've been applying in our lives these past weeks, encourage us, they they motivate us, they challenge us, they help us to continue living out our faith and trust in Jesus Christ day by day in his power, not ours. They encourage us and help us and challenge us and motivate us to live out that faith that we have in the Lord by our obedience to the Lord, once again, in his power at work in us. And so we're going to look once again at this story of the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ, and we're going to examine for just a few moments together as family the perspective from the shepherds. The shepherds certainly had uh, a unique perspective on the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so we're going to find out how they saw things, and we're going to try to glean some uh, application points for our lives today and this week from their testimony in the Word. So we're in Luke chapter 2. We'll begin reading in verse 1. Uh, Luke wrote, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. We'll stop there real quick. Uh, Caesar Augustus was the title given to the ruler of Rome, the emperor of Rome at this point in time. The census was declared, decreed uh, by the emperor of Rome, and the census included all of the peoples and all of the nations in and around, for the most part, the Mediterranean Sea that were living under Roman rule. And the purpose of this census was was twofold. For the most part, it was a twofold purpose. This census would require registration from everybody within the Roman world, and it would allow the Roman government first to count all of the citizens under their rule so that they could have an accurate count to be able to assess taxes uh, from all the citizens so that they could continue to receive money from them. Secondly, it was also to allow the Roman government to get a count of all the Roman citizens who were living in uh, Rome, but certainly also in other nations, because they also wanted to keep track of which ones of their citizens should be enlisted and serving in the Roman army. And so this was a a census that we see uh, that Caesar Augustus declared, decreed, and we continue in verse 2. The first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria, so everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. 
Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So we can stop here, and we notice a few points as we read this passage, and it's a familiar passage, and you've read this over and over again, more than likely throughout the years, and so God is going to continue his work in us of bringing new insight to us from this word, and in particular from this passage. So though it's familiar, we can continue to receive insight from the Lord uh, for today and this week. And so we see a couple of things stand out. Number one, Joseph and Mary endured difficult travel. They endured difficult travel. This trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem would be about 70 to 80 miles. Now the trip in this day and time would have been very difficult because of the terrain that they would have to travel. Much of that terrain still is visible there in Israel. Uh, if you're there in Israel, you'll notice, and it won't take you long to realize, though there are roads and there's transportation, and that's very positive, you, it won't take you long to realize, wow, there is some challenging terrain. And then to think back to the scriptures and know that they made this trip on foot would have been difficult. 70 to 80 miles. We also know the terrain was very difficult for anyone, but especially Mary, who was very pregnant. And the travel would have been literally uphill because Bethlehem is located just outside of Jerusalem in the southern part of Israel, but in the mountain area. And so it would have literally been traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and it would have literally been an uphill travel, which would have made uh, the travel even more difficult. And so Joseph and Mary endured difficult travel. I think when we read this, we don't always understand the difficulty, uh, the endurance that would have been required uh, in this. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, it's a, it's it's. Uh, uh, All right. All right. <laughs> I told you there'd be new insight. You read the Word of God. It's familiar, but there's always something new. Exhibit A. All right. That's good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, fire department team. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you so much. Appreciate that quick response and that quick action. That would have made it difficult for Rod later on. That wouldn't have been good. Uh, and I'm thankful that that happened now and not while Rod was sitting over there playing. A lot to be thankful for. Remember, Scripture says give thanks in all circumstances. We're to give thanks for and in all that God allows us to uh, experience. And so we give thanks. And uh, thank you. So uh, difficult travel. And they were also dealing with difficult circumstances. As if the travel wasn't a challenge enough, once Joseph and Mary got to Bethlehem, we know that the inns were booked. There was no room. Due to the registration, due to everyone having to travel for the census, there was no room. And so Mary gave birth, as we know, to Jesus out back in the stable, in the cave. She wrapped Jesus in cloth, laid him in a manger, a feeding trough that was normally used for animals. And so we can stop here again, as we were sharing last night, so many opportunities for us to stop and just marvel at the grace and greatness of God and the birth of our Son, our God's Son, our Savior, Jesus. Take time to just marvel at the miracle of God. And so we stop and we just consider that the birth of our Savior, Jesus, God the Son, the Son of God, the Messiah, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, Jesus was born and he had such a humble start, such a humble beginning in a manger in Bethlehem. It is really beyond all of our comprehension. The King of kings and Lord of lords came to earth and began in such a humble manner. I love what one Bible scholar said. Christ was content with a manger at his birth so we could have a mansion when we die. So we understand 
just the beauty of this passage. It just leaps out at us. We continue in verse 8. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you who is Messiah, Christ the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with an angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. What an awesome scene. What an awesome message. What an awesome Savior. Let's just think about this. And just for just a, few, a moment here, first, we look at this awesome scene and we know it was awesome because first, the message was brought through an angel. Secondly, the message was brought through an angel to ordinary shepherds. Third, the message was brought through an angel to ordinary shepherds doing ordinary things. They were out in the fields. They were doing their job. Fourth, the message was good news. Fifth, the message brought great joy. Sixth, the message brought great good news and great joy to all the people. And the message, seventh, was the climax of what we had seen predicted and promised from the Old Testament. The Messiah, Christ the Lord, had come. The birth of King Jesus had actually happened there in Bethlehem. And then we also see what an awesome scene. Can you imagine being the shepherds? They literally got to experience a concert of the angels. Can you even imagine? I mean, I thought the concert that we had last night of our different choirs was amazing. What a blessing. What a blessing to worship our Lord and Savior together with the children, with the teenagers, with the adults in English and Spanish. What a blessing. But man, I look at this. And those shepherds, they had a front row seat to a concert of the angels. Wow. Continue in verse 15. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message. They were told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. So after the shepherds uh, heard the concert, the angel left. The shepherd said, let's go check things out. And they left immediately. And I would imagine that that was something that they didn't have to have a vote for. They took off and they left. And they found Jesus with Joseph and Mary, just as they were told. Everything that they had been told, they found just the way that they had been told by the angel. And then we continue in verse 20. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. The shepherds then began glorifying and praising God. Why? Because what they had been told was true. That's why. They understood and realized that all that they had heard was true. And so the message from the shepherds to you and to me this morning is real simple. Salvation is available to us. Salvation is available to us. And salvation is available because Jesus Christ, the Savior, came. We know the birth of Jesus led to life for you and for me. You see, Jesus fulfilled God's plan for his life in perfect obedience. Jesus perfectly obeyed God the Father's will for his life in his birth, in his life, in his death, burial, and resurrection. And so we know this birth of Jesus led to the perfect life of Jesus, which led to the death of Jesus, which led to the burial of Jesus, which led to the resurrection of Jesus, which leads to life for you and me, abundant and eternal. By God's grace through our faith in Jesus. So we know in the birth of Jesus, this message is salvation is available to us because the Savior has come. And so we look in this passage and we put ourselves for this morning into the perspective of the shepherds. And so as we look at the shepherds and listen to their message, 
What are some things that we can apply? Well, let me just share a few points. There's many, and we won't labor long on these, but let me just share a few points that we can apply today and this week. And I would encourage each of us to take time, especially as we're with family, and we'll do that here in just a moment, but to take time with family throughout this week uh, to apply these truths that we see from the passage. First, since salvation is available, we can rejoice. We can rejoice. When you stop and think about this scene and you look at the characters around the manger, Mary rejoiced, as we heard last night, when she found out that God had chosen her to give birth to the Savior. We know the angels rejoiced, the shepherds rejoiced, we also know Simeon rejoiced. In Luke chapter 2, if you look to Luke chapter 2 in verse 28, we are introduced to a man named Simeon. Verse 28, Luke said, Simeon took him up in his arms, that being Jesus, the babe, praised God and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you have promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Simeon was promised by God that he would not die until he saw the Lord's salvation. And so Simeon was there in the temple area, and when Joseph and Mary came and brought Jesus to the temple on the eighth day, as the law required, Simeon saw Joseph and Mary, and immediately the Spirit of God connected with him, and he understood and realized this baby that they brought, this one named Jesus, he is the Savior. So he took him in his arms, and he glorified God. He praised God. He rejoiced in the Lord because he had seen the Lord's salvation. And so we, as well, this morning, we can rejoice in the truth of God's word. We can rejoice in the account here from Luke and Matthew of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can rejoice that the Savior has come. We can rejoice that we have forgiveness of sins through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We can rejoice that this word is true from cover to cover. We can rejoice that the evidence is overwhelming for Christ, his birth, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. We know and believe the gospel. We know and believe in Christ Jesus because we know it's true. So we can rejoice. What an opportunity for us here on Christmas morning, to rejoice together in the Savior's birth, to rejoice in what this means to us, to take time and to talk with our family, to talk with our children, to talk with one another, and to share what is it about this amazing birth of the Savior that causes you to rejoice most? What stands out to you? What are a few things? What's the main thing? And we can dialogue and we can rejoice and rejoice and rejoice over the different aspects. We can rejoice. What does this mean to you and to me this morning? So I was talking with a brother this morning. He was sharing that he spent time last night just dwelling and meditating on the differences that God has brought into his life from last Christmas to this Christmas. And rejoicing, he was rejoicing in the Lord and his work in his life because he acknowledged and realized he was different. He was a different man than he was a year ago. He's a different man today. Deeper in his faith, more in love with the Lord than before. And what an opportunity for each of us to be able to rejoice together as we uh, celebrate the birth of our Savior Jesus. Secondly, since the salvation is available, we can receive. We can receive this gift of love and life in Christ Jesus. Luke told us at the beginning of his gospel, he sat down and he wrote an orderly account and he used the careful research of Luke, the careful, meticulous historian, the good doctor, and he also relied on eyewitness accounts. Why did he do such careful research? Why did he rely on eyewitness accounts to record this orderly account of the life of Jesus, his ministry, his birth, uh, the death, burial, crucifixion, uh, the resurrection, and all that Luke recorded? It was so that we could believe in Jesus and receive him by faith. We believe in the virgin birth of Jesus in Bethlehem 
years ago. We believe in the perfect life of Jesus Christ. We believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe Jesus sacrificed his life for us on the cross of Calvary. We believe that the tomb is empty. We believe that salvation is available to us who would receive God's gift of love and life by responding to his grace at work in our lives through our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We believe these truths because God has told us these truths in his word. And we know his word is true. We know his word has been tested and it's trustworthy for you and for me. And so as John told us in John 1, 12, yet to all who received him, He gave them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And so this morning, this day, this time as we celebrate the birth of our Savior Jesus, we certainly rejoice, but we also take time to believe in the truth that we see in this passage and to make sure we've received the gift, the greatest gift ever sent, the gift of love and life in Christ Jesus. And then we make sure that we take time to receive all the blessings that God provides for us in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul told us we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. This birth, this one in the manger in Bethlehem was full of blessings for you and me. And in Christ Jesus, a relationship with him, we have been blessed with every blessing, not just some, not just many, not just most, every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. So we can certainly take time to make sure that we receive those blessings in part within the context of family, because the family that we are celebrating within this morning, this spiritual family, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, your individual families, certainly a reservoir of the blessings of God for your life and for mine. And so we rejoice, we receive, but then we also know that since salvation is available, we can share We can share the shepherds. What did they do? They shared with everyone everywhere they went. Luke said they shared with others what they had seen and heard. They were sharing about Jesus, the birth of Jesus, and the reality that this one born king of the Jews would save his people from their sins. They were sharing the good news. And we have the privilege to share the good news of great joy for all the people today. We are God's representatives, God's ambassadors, God's witnesses We're called to go and make disciples of all nations, to be fishers of people. We are called to share the good news of Jesus. And so on Christmas morning, that's one of the things that we can sit around and we can share the good news of salvation that is available in Christ Jesus, the blessings that we've received from our salvation in Christ Jesus. We're able to share with others that Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. We're able to share with others that salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. We're able to share with others God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We're able to share with others everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. What a privilege, what a joy for us to be able to share the good news of Jesus, to share the good news of great joy for all the people, to be able to pour that message into our children, into our grandchildren, into one another. This message never gets old. It is fresh and new every morning. And yes, we celebrate the birth of our Savior every day throughout the year. Yes, we celebrate his birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection, and all that that means for us. But especially here on this morning, what a joy. What a unique privilege to sit together as families on Christmas morning, worshiping our Savior together, and once again reflecting on this incredible, amazing birth, this gift from God to you and to me. And then another point we see is since salvation is available, we can endure. As I look at this passage and as I think about what God is certainly doing in our lives, Uh, endurance kind of just jumps off the pages. We see endurance, and we reflect and think back what we've studied. Zechariah endured nine months of silence because of the Lord's discipline for his doubt and unbelief in the angel's message. Elizabeth endured her entire pregnancy with a speechless, silent husband. 
Yes, ladies are high-fiving, amening. Joseph and Mary endured difficult travel. I mean, just the thought of Mary's endurance and what she went through just simply on that 70 to 80 mile trip. Joseph and Mary endured difficult circumstances. I can't imagine getting to Bethlehem and then realizing, oh my gracious, there's no place for us to stay. We know Joseph and Mary endured multiple relocations with Jesus, that infant babe, Jesus, because King Herod was trying to kill Jesus and say they were moving. We know Jesus endured challenges, temptations, opposition, ridicule, pain, suffering, as he fulfilled God's plan for his life, as he rescued us from our sins. And so as we reflect on this story, we see at every point from all of the different characters in the story, we start to see the endurance. Shepherds just enduring, doing their jobs day after day, night after night, lonely, out in the fields. And we understand and realize that we too today, we face challenges, we face difficulties, we face temptations, we face sufferings, we face trials, troubles, challenges. We know this because we see this in the Word. The Word is obvious and it's honest with us. Jesus said, in this world you will have sufferings. James told us, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials and temptations of many different kinds. Didn't say if, he said when. The Christian life is the best life. The Christian life is the blessed life, but it's not the easy life. We all battle. And there may be some here this morning in the midst of the battle. We all battle with addictions, with anger, with bitterness, with complaining and criticizing others, conflict. We battle with selfishness, resentment, unforgiveness, sorrow, grief, loneliness, selfishness, and many other challenges that come our way that are a result of the flesh. And so one of the messages that we see this morning that I think rings true for us is since salvation is available, we can endure. There's stories of endurance throughout, and we can endure the challenges and the difficulties and the struggles and the disappointments and the loneliness and the trials and the temptations that we face today. We can endure in Christ Jesus because the Savior has come. He is Christ the Lord. We know his birth, what it means for us, it led ultimately to new life, abundant life, eternal life with us for us with God in Christ Jesus, and therefore we can endure because we know the Lord is with us. And so often we forget, and we know this better than anyone that the Lord is with us. We see it from cover to cover, and yet at times we struggle because we forget that the Lord is with me. He is with me. This is why the writer of Hebrews, his encouragement to us is so vitally important. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with endurance. The race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that we might not lose heart, so that we might not grow weary. 
We endure the challenges and difficulties and struggles that we face today in Christ Jesus. And we're able to endure in Christ because he is with us. And as we fix our eyes on Jesus and his endurance for us, he endured the cross for you and for me. He endured through the crown of thorns. He endured through the nails, his hands and feet. He endured through the spear in his side. He endured through the ridicule and the mocking and the flogging and the beating. He endured the cross. He scorned its shame. He could sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem in that manger ultimately led to the cross. But we rejoice, and we know endurance is ours in Christ Jesus because that cross led to the tomb, and we know that tomb is empty. It's empty. He's not there. He is risen. He is exalted. He is alive. He is with us. And so a message that we need to receive this morning is, yes, we rejoice. Yes, we believe and receive in him, and yes, we share, but we also Receive this message from the Lord right where you're at. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, the challenge, the struggle, you can endure. You can endure in Christ Jesus because he is with you. And he will empower you to continue living out that faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He understands. He was tempted as we are, yet he never sinned. He understands. And he's ready able and willing to help us to continue following him by faith. What a message. What a savior. This one, one king of the Jews, Jesus Christ. There was a mall that had a contest. They, they held a contest a few years back, and the contest was during the Christmas season. And what they did was they said uh, there was a place that you could go, a couple of places you could go in the mall, and they just asked uh, to everyone who wanted to to try to describe Christmas uh, in 25 words or less. And uh, they wanted to see uh, what we, the, the folks that went into the mall could come up with. And so uh, 25 words or less. And so they did this throughout the Christmas season, and uh, the winning response uh, was someone who wrote these words, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The reason we're able to celebrate Christmas is because Jesus has come. The Savior has come. He fulfilled God's plan for his life. He has provided salvation for all who will believe in him and receive him by faith. So I want us to take this time now just to reflect on this message. Let me ask you to bow in prayer. Our worship team's going to come. And I want to just encourage you this morning. This is a unique blessing. And so I'm going to encourage you uh, kind of to do what we've been talking about, the walk in the word. Uh, for the most part, we're all families here. We're one big family uh, in Christ Jesus. But we're made up of multiple individual families. And many of us have our children here. And so uh, we don't get to celebrate Christmas on Sunday morning every year. This is unique. So I want to encourage you as you're here with your family, and you can even start doing it now. I would encourage you to do it now. Uh, dads, moms, you got grandparents. Many of us have grandparents around here uh, with us and see grandparents here. I want to encourage you just to grab your kids by the hand, and I want to encourage you just to circle up, to huddle up. I would encourage you to come and up here at the altar. You can come and kneel at the altar. And I would just encourage you to take this time, this blessing with your family to pray. Spend time huddled up, arm in arm, hand in hand, kneeling, standing to the sides, maybe up here at the front as these are doing. Just spend a time, and I want to encourage you to spend time praying. Speak into your children. Bless them. In Jesus' name, spend a few moments rejoicing in the Lord. Spend a few moments just praising the Savior. If you don't have your kids with you, it's just you and your husband, your wife, do the same. Just do it. Stand up. Hug one another, arm in arm, hand in hand. Spend this time 
with family, loving one another, encouraging one another, praying together, rejoicing. Brothers, get with other brothers, sisters with other sisters. If you're here and you don't have family here, grab on, jump into another family. They'll accept you. Just grab in, get on to another, get in another family. Take this opportunity just to stand and rejoice in the Lord together. And as you finish praying, and as you finish rejoicing, and as you finish giving praise to your Father God, then we'll join together and we'll worship in this song together. We'll sing our praises to the Father. He's worthy. If you've yet to receive this gift of salvation, we would love to introduce you to Jesus. We would love for you to come and speak to one of us, our pastors, so that we could introduce you to Jesus Christ. Let's take this time as family, huddled up with our children, loving one another, and then we're going to stand and worship the Father together.